Okay. All right, everyone, I think we can get started. Uh, hopefully, we can get started. Let me see if I can begin the recording of this. All right, everyone, um, this is the first meeting of the Federal Society. I'm all glad you're all here. Uh, this is, we have been honored to have Professor Ford come down here and talk to us about the Brown v. EMA case in video game law. So, if you all give him a round of applause for coming. All right, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here for my first visit to Cornell to talk about the Brown versus EMA decision. This is a case that came down not too long ago. You probably are familiar with the basics of it. It was the case that finally resolved the um, question of whether or not the states can regulate access by minors to certain violent video games, something many states have tried to do, but the lower courts had almost uniformly struck down all of those efforts. So now that the Supreme Court has weighed in, um, the issue is largely resolved, although I'll mention one wrinkle that's left over from, these, uh, from this decision that might allow state legislatures to uh, try one more approach if they so choose though I haven't heard anything so far indicating that they might do so. First, a little background on the video game industry. The commercial video game industry largely starts with Pong. Pong is not the first video game, it's not the first arcade game, but it's the first blockbuster hit. It's the game that shows that there is commercial promise for this technology. This game is pretty simple, and so as you can imagine, this is not likely to stir up any controversy over violent or sexual content. However, the first game that actually caused some controversy is a fairly old one. Dating back to 1976, the game Death Race from Exidy actually did stir up a little bit of controversy. As you can see from this Newsweek article, um, assuming they're serious here, they did find the game objectionable. Because in the game, what you do is you drive around either yourself or with um, a second driver, who you would be competing against, and you attempt to drive your vehicle over as many zombies as possible, and when you do so, the cross will appear to indicate um, that the zombie has been killed. Now, I'm going to show a screenshot of this, a little gory, <laughs> so if you're sensitive, look away. <laughs> probably a little surprising that this would cause any controversy given that at this time you could find movies, of course, that go much further. In fact, the movie that this game is loosely inspired by, Death Race 2000, the David Carradine, Sylvester Stallone, the theme movie, of course, is far more violent than this game. Has anyone seen that? It's, a, it's one of those terrible B movies that is so bad that some people find some enjoyment out of it. Um, <laughs> Well, there are some big name people in there. I believe it was Sylvester Stallone's first major movie. The basic theme of the movie is that competitors attempt to drive down pedestrians uh, for points. So this is the first game that stirs up some controversy. However, as you can see from the sorts of titles that are being released at this time, most are not the types of games that people would consider violent or that people would worry about their children playing. It doesn't mean there wasn't any additional controversy at this time over video games, but it didn't focus that much on violence. Now, there were some people who were worried about the level of violence in the games, even with these titles, but the controversy at this time tended to be more about uh, kids uh, skipping school to go to arcades, kids going to arcades where they're going to encounter uh, seedy individuals, be exposed to drug dealers, I was going to play this clip um, if I, I guess it's either sound or video. Uh, this is a Saturday Night Live clip, so obviously it's meant as a joke, but it's an indication of what the concerns were about video games. So it's a fake documentary about a kid who is now living on the streets, begging for quarters so that he can play video games. No indication that there's a concern about violence. It's all about addiction, truancy, and um, dealing with unsavory characters. <laughs> well, without the sound, it doesn't quite uh, have the same punch, uh, but uh, it, it is uh, an indication of what sorts of concerns are going on at the time. We have to jump ahead a bit to the Mortal Kombat era to find renewed concern about the violence in video games. 
Now, Mortal Kombat is a well-known title. There was another title, Night Trap, which is also the focus of the Senator's concern. Uh, this is a game that they claimed was um, highly inappropriate for younger players. You can watch this game because it's a live action game. You can watch the game on YouTube. And uh, you might recognize the actress who's on the cover. It's uh, the actress who was in different strokes. Uh, but it's very corny. It's not graphically violent um, in terms of blood or anything like that. But you're attempting to save the women in this house from these odd sort of vampire creatures. Um, well, should I show the video or should I <laughs> do the audio for the clip? The audio Probably should do the audio. Okay. So this is an excerpt from the hearings that occurred back in 1993. And one thing that's interesting about these hearings is what motivated them to happen. Now, ostensibly they're about video game violence and children having access to games that are inappropriate. There's also another possible subtext here, which is that at this time, Sega has gained a lot of market share selling a more graphically violent version of Mortal Kombat than Nintendo. So some people have claimed that these hearings were actually uh, in Nintendo's interest, and that Nintendo may have actually um, caused a bit of this controversy by directly or indirectly contacting Senator Lieberman and indicating to him that these games are violent and inappropriate for children. If you watch some of the other clips from these hearings, you'll see that Nintendo and Sega are not on the same team in this. Nintendo's um, vice president is heavily criticizing the representative from Sega and even at one point argues for government to intervene uh, pretty significantly to try to restrict the sort of content that's allowing Sega to gain market share. You want to go ahead? Violence and violent images permeate more and more aspects of our lives. And I think it's time to draw the line. I know that one place parents want us to draw the line is with violence in video games. The fact is that a new generation of video games crosses that line containing the most horrible depictions of graphic violence and sex, including particularly violence against women. Like the Grinch who stole Christmas, these violent video games threaten to rob this particular holiday season of a spirit of goodwill. Instead of enriching a child's mind, these games teach a child to enjoy inflicting torture. For those who have not uh, seen these uh, so-called games before, I want to show you uh, what we're talking about. What you're about to see are scenes from two of the most violent new video games. First, we have Mortal Kombat which is a martial arts contest involving digitized characters. We're going to show two versions of the game. In the first segment, which is Sega's version, blood splatters from the contestants' heads. When a player wins, the so-called death sequence begins. The game narrator instructs the player to finish, and I quote, finish his opponent. The player may then choose a method of murder, ranging from ripping a heart out to pulling off the head of the opponent with spinal cord attached. The second version made by Nintendo leaves out the blood and decapitation, but as you will see, it is still a violent game. Introduce our panelists any further. We'd like to watch the video, Senator Lieberman. This is Senator Cole. Thank you, Senator Cole. Well, the, the tapes are ready, which I described before. They begin with the two sequences from uh, Mortal Kombat First is the uh, Sega version. Se second, uh, regrettably, is a very brief, but nonetheless illustrative sequence from the Nintendo version. Uh, actually, the <laughs> so in the Sega version, the blood is red. 
begin to sweat. <laughs> and there are no fatalities in this version. This is a game that may be less familiar. This was not a big selling game. It probably did, whatever sales it generated were probably attributable to this controversy. <laughs> yeah. You're not either one. You're some observer who's using traps and various controls to s try to save the women. Oh, so you're the one. It's one of those, yeah. The senators do misdescribe the game at one point and suggest that you're trying to kill the women yourself. Yeah. It's So the outcome of these hearings are that we end up with the ESRB. And the senators do make clear that they would prefer to have the industry engage in some self-regulation. They do say that if the industry will come up with some sort of rating system that will be enforced across the board, that they won't then try to legislate any restrictions on the industry. Uh, so that's somewhat similar to what was happening uh, back in the era of controversy over comic books, where the senators did make statements that they didn't want to regulate the content, but they didn't want more self-regulation. And if the industry would self-regulate, that could head off um, any kind of regulation on the part of the government. So we get the ESRB, things are quiet for a while, but then controversy flares up again. Grand Theft Auto is one of the games that generates more controversy. And we do end up with a variety of states trying to regulate access to various violent video games. Uh, one of the statutes is this from California. Violent video game means a video game in which the range of options available to a player and kill includes killing, maiming, dismembering, or sexually assaulting an image of a human being if those acts are depicted in the game in a manner that does either of the following. So we have two sections that says either this gets um, wiped out before it goes to the Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit, uh, uh, that this is unconstitutional. The state accepts that this definition is unconstitutional for not having an exception for material that has some redeeming value from minors. So the Supreme Court ends up talking about the definition under A. So focus on that. So it's going to get in front of the courts, and there are two approaches you might take to these video games. One is to treat them as obscenity to say that they, these games are seen at least for minors and therefore can be regulated on that basis. And there's a prior Supreme Court case dealing with sexually explicit material in which the Supreme Court says that minors' access to that sort of material can be restricted. So one of the questions that comes up during this litigation is whether or not that special rule for items that are seen for minors can also be applied to violent material. So that becomes one potential avenue to um, to the state regulating minors' access. The other is for the state to show that there's empirical evidence of these games causing some sort of harm to minors, which means that the courts are going to have to consider some scientific evidence. Now, I want to say a few general things about this, because I think this set of cases is interesting from the perspective of trying to look at how good of a job courts do with assessing scientific evidence. On the whole, I think the courts did fairly mediocre job of dealing with scientific evidence in these cases. While I think that they ultimately ended up with the right outcome, 
I don't think they did a great job, for the most part, with the scientific evidence that was before them. So what are some reasons why? Well, the most obvious reason why courts are going to have difficulty with scientific evidence is because judges and lawyers lack the specialized training to deal with scientific evidence. Now, of course, there are plenty of exceptions. There are lawyers who are going to do a very good job. The patent bar has to deal with scientific evidence, and they are often going to do a good job. But many lawyers don't have the training to deal with scientific evidence, and judges don't have the training to try to understand it. And so that's going to present a problem for trying to translate the scientific evidence into something usable in court. So that's one problem. There are others. Uh, there's a nice article by Susan Hack where she runs through some of the challenges that courts have in dealing with scientific evidence. For example, courts are on a schedule. Litigation may move very slowly, but ultimately courts want to deal with their dockets on a schedule that may not correspond to the pace of scientific advancement or discovery. So it may be that courts are going to have to resolve issues in the face of a lack of scientific evidence or a lack of scientific answers. Also, science may not be able to provide the sorts of answers that courts want. Courts want to know if um, there is some specific uh, evidence of, of a causal relationship between um, something and some negative outcome. Whereas science may only be able to say that we, we know on the probabilities that uh, certain things will cause a certain level of harm in society, but it's difficult for the evidence to say we know that this particular person, for example, got lung cancer from smoking. Scientists may be able to generate lots of evidence that smoking is likely to contribute or cause lung cancer in the population, but it's harder to say in a specific case that smoking may cause lung cancer. Another problem is, is that the judicial system is adversarial. So you're going to have scientists who have been hired on as experts making the case for their clients. You won't necessarily have access to uh, um, uh, scientific research that's generated outside the litigation process. The questions that come up in litigation may not be ones that a body of scientists are actually researching. The scientific evidence that it, that's needed in a particular case may be generated just for that case. And so you won't have a body of literature to look at. Now, the video game cases are interesting because you don't have some of the problems that you have in other cases. In the video game violence cases, you do have a large number of researchers who are not on anybody's payroll who are doing research into the questions relevant to the cases. So you might predict that this should be a set of cases where the courts would do a better job assessing the science because you don't have some of the problems that you ordinarily have. I have a general example from the Seventh Circuit that um, is just a couple minutes long. This is just an oral argument, so if you want to switch over to the audio, uh, I'll play a short excerpt of what can go wrong when lawyers are attempting to translate the scientific evidence to the courts. Here we are up on appeal before the Seventh Circuit. The issue in this case uh, relates to the evidence that adult bookstores or adult establishments are causing an increase in the level of crime in Indiana. And so the bookstores do hire an expert to do some research into the question of whether or not any additional crime or negative outcomes can be attributed to the bookstores and I'll play an excerpt where Judge Easterbrook asked the attorney a question about what the expert actually did. So this will be a cautionary example for those who may one day have to explain something to a judge. Um, uh, it's not on a slide. You just have to exit. And um, can I exit? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> percentage of adult businesses, you know, as opposed to those near the 25% mark? This, we presented the testimony and the report of Dr. Lins, who did two things. Dr. Lins did what Alameda Books, the plurality, said it could do. One, he attacked the data on which the city relied, the studies that it presented, 
and said that these were not reliable. And the other thing he did was he conducted a study of Indiana crime over a five-year period from 1998 to 2003. And he mapped the crime. He looked at the police reports that were generated. He did a hotspot analysis, namely by looking at crime in the vicinity of the adult bookstores as newly what defined. What do you mean by a hotspot analysis? Well, a hotspot analysis, Your Honor, is looking at crime within a 200-foot, a 500-foot, and 1,000-foot. No, that tells you how far he's looking using the available data. What kind of analysis is it? I look for the standard statistical tools like multivariate regression. They're not there. In fact, in the study that's in the record, none of the tools is explained. He announces his conclusion. He doesn't explain how he reached it. There are a few circles drawn around bookstores. The circles drawn around bookstores are a considerable distance short from good statistical analysis. The notion that the adult bookstores are associated with adverse secondary effects. No. Are you going to answer my question, which is what did he do? What statistical tools did he use? Dr. Lins looked at the addresses where the bookstores were located. Yes, but how? Did he use a particular statistical tool? Did he use a logit analysis? Is this a probit analysis? I can't for the life of me tell what he did. If it's not in the report, Your Honor, then it's not. Okay. Well, then I can't tell you precisely what he did. For all I know, he put on a big turban and he went, mmm, mmm, there it is. No, he didn't, Your Honor. So this is a case where the lawyer was not able to provide all of the answers as to what exactly the expert did. Now, Judge Easterbrook was pretty hard on the study in that excerpt. If you read the opinion from the case, you'll find that he's not as hard on it there. So what he said during the argument I don't think was entirely fair, but the lawyer wasn't able to respond to the concerns and explain exactly what happened. So this is the problem that you're likely to have when lawyers are responsible for translating scientific evidence. They're not trained to do it. And so courts may approach the scientific evidence in a way that scientists wouldn't because there's nobody there to explain otherwise. I have a couple of handouts. Did people pick this up outside? There's one from this case from the District of Minnesota I want to call your attention to. So in this particular part of the litigation, the state of Minnesota is largely relying on one study, well, one meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is a way to provide a summary of many other individual studies. It's an alternative to taking a narrative literature review approach. If you've got a pile of studies, you could just explain what happened. But a meta-analysis is a way to quantify what happened in the various studies and combine them to give a sense of the literature as a whole. There's nothing illegitimate about doing this. There's nothing strange about doing this. But if you look at footnote one, you'll see that the judge is suspicious of this particular approach. And he also says something interesting beyond just being suspicious. He says, Dr. Anderson's meta-analysis seems to suggest that one can take a number of studies, each of which he admits do not prove the proposition in question, and stack them up until a collective proof emerges. Understanding what the judge is saying here is that he's taking a very different approach to this body of literature than a scientist would. A scientist would be unlikely to claim that any one of these studies proves that video games cause aggression. It's a hard question to answer. And so you want to have a large number of studies to rely on before you claim that video games cause aggression. The judge gives the impression that he finds the whole idea of a meta-analysis a little bit strange, because if you actually have a study out there that proves the connection, bring that one in to me. Don't bring me a literature review, even a quantified sort of literature review in the form of a meta-analysis. Just bring me the one study. But who would think one study could really answer this question? So if the state came in with only one study, and that study happened to conclude that there's a relationship, I think you should be fairly skeptical, because a lot can go wrong in a particular study. The sample 
may be wildly unrepresented in the samples for many of these psychology studies or the students in the psychology professor's class. You'd want to have a variety of studies taking different approaches with different samples before you draw any strong conclusions that there's a relationship. However, here we see a judge, um, I think, giving the impression that you could approach this whole issue in a very different way. That you could come in with the one study, and that would be the definitive study that would show that there is a connection. Another pair of examples is the Eighth and Ninth Circuit example. If you look at what the Eighth Circuit says in the sections that I've underlined, the Eighth Circuit is saying that in order for them to uphold state regulation of violent video games, they want to see evidence that is scientifically certain that there's a causal relationship between violent video games and aggression. You see the Ninth Circuit says, we don't actually need evidence that rises to the level of scientific certainty. So there was actually a split between the circuits, despite the fact they came to the same outcome, striking down the legislation. There's a split here as to what the standard should be. The Supreme Court didn't resolve this, but the Eighth Circuit standard is a little bit peculiar. What's particularly strange about it is where they got the idea that you would need evidence that rises to a level of scientific certainty. You might think that would be the argument the video game industry made, right? Because that would make it very hard for the state to win. This is actually the argument the state made. The state actually, I think, kind of made a mess of things. And because they didn't want to have to argue that there was a causal relationship between violent video games and aggressive behavior. They wanted to just argue there was a correlation. And for some reason, the attorneys for the state of Minnesota decided that when you're talking about causation, you can only do that if you're certain. In other words, it doesn't make sense to speak of some evidence of causation or mild evidence of causation. It only makes sense to talk about causation when it's definitive, you're certain. Until you get to that point, you only talk about correlation. It was a very odd approach for the attorneys to take. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but I think they actually confused the Eighth Circuit into upping the standard. Because in the prior case that the Eighth Circuit cites, the standard wasn't that high. But they interpret the prior case to have that high of a standard. I think because the state of Minnesota portrayed the prior case that way to the detriment of their argument. So those are a couple of examples where things go wrong. Why? Because the lawyers are responsible for translating the science, and they're not necessarily going to be up to the task. So let's turn to the Supreme Court's decision itself. The Ninth Circuit has held that the California statute violates the First Amendment. Now we're before the Supreme Court, and they answer the first question about treating violence as obscenity in this way. They say that we're not going to treat non-sexual conduct or, or uh, non-sexual material as obscenity. So that theory is knocked out. And this is a theory that has some strong proponents, like a, a law professor named Kevin Saunders, who argue that we should treat violent video games as potentially obscene for minors, and that would be the basis for regulation. The court here says no. We're not going to do that. You're not going to be able to regulate violent video games on the theory that they are obscene for minors. The obscenity theory only applies to sexual material. So that theory is now dead um, as a result of Brown. But there's still the second possibility of showing that there is a compelling state interest and that you have evidence of a problem and that the state's attempt to regulate First Amendment protected material will actually address the problem. Now, if you listen to the people who do research in this area, they're very confident, based on many, many studies, they're very confident that media violence does, in fact, cause aggression. It's not just correlated with aggression, but it actually causes it. And the leading researcher in this area, Craig Anderson, as you can see here, argues that we've known that since 1975. Now, he's speaking about a literature there that is tied to um, something other than video games. People weren't researching video game violence at that point, since for the most part it didn't really exist. Most of the games are variations on Pong, although Death Race is um, a counterexample. The Supreme Court says that there really isn't causal evidence that violent video games lead to aggressive behavior. I think they're mistaken on that. 
And I think Anderson is right that they have causal evidence. The question is how persuasive you find it. Because we don't need to describe causal evidence in terms of scientific certainty. We could say you have a little bit, but it's not necessarily persuasive. But even if you accept the research in this area and think that on the whole it's persuasive, the court, I think, was still correct to find that the state could um, regulate minors' access to violent video games. And I'll give four reasons. All right. First, the state is, as we've already seen, supposed to identify an actual problem in need of solving. And the curtailment of free speech must be actually necessary to the solution. If you look at the definition that is at issue, it's framed in terms only of violence directed at human beings. And it's directed at violence that is fairly extreme. A reasonable person considering the game as a whole would find appeals to a deviant or morbid interest of minors. It is patently offensive to prevailing standards in the community as to what is suitable for minors. This is likely to be very extreme, graphic, realistic violence. This is not, however, matching up with the research. The researchers define aggression much more broadly. It doesn't have to be directed at humans. It doesn't have to be graphic. Human aggression researchers define aggression as behavior that is intended to harm another individual. The behavior is expected by the perpetrator to have some chance of actually harming that individual. And the perpetrator believes that the target individual is motivated to avoid the harm. Media violence refers to media depictions of aggressive and violent behavior directed at characteristics in the media story. Those characters can be human or non-human, cartoonish or visually realistic, fictional, unrealistic, or animated violence is still considered violence if it meets the above definitions. Their conception of violence is enormously broad. In contrast to what the public's definition of violence is likely to be, and politicians' definition of violence. So politicians and the public are going to focus on something that's very graphic. These researchers are telling us, no, it doesn't have to be graphic. And then they start to draw some conclusions that I think most people would find a little bit hard to believe. So here's a 1986 study where Anderson and another author claim that Zaxxon is a highly aggressive game. Zaxxon is a game from the 80s where a ship flies through this asteroid and blows up some buildings. It's not the sort of thing most people would consider particularly violent or of any concern if minors are playing it. This is a study that attempts to rate the level of violence in E-rated video games. Let me call your attention to just one example, Galaga. The percentage of violence in this game is 100%. It's just non-stop violence as far as the researchers are concerned here. But this is Galaga. Here's what Galaga looks like. This is not the sort of thing that anybody is going to attempt to ban for minors. This is not the sort of thing that will be banned under the California statute for minors to purchase on their own. So even if you thought the research was rock solid and didn't have any doubts about it, and I do have some doubts, but if you didn't have any, then that statute doesn't match up with the scientific literature. That statute actually suggests that this is just fine, and yet the researchers are saying, now, this is also part of the problem. Cartoonish violence is also part of the problem. But that statute is directed only at the graphic violence, which the researchers argue is not quite the right way to look at the issue, because you need to recognize, they say, that violence is actually found in Saturday morning cartoons in games like this, because it does represent aggression as defined a moment ago. So the statutes, and this is an argument the Supreme Court makes in the majority opinion, the statute doesn't match up with the research, even if you believe it. And there are grounds for doubting it. But even if you believe it, it doesn't match up with the research. So that's one reason that I think the court um, was right. A second reason is that when the researchers in media violence make the claim that we know media violence causes aggression, they're speaking very generally. Even if you accept that broad conclusion, a lot of qualifications will fall later when you start asking questions, well, what about the broader context of the media violence? What if it's um, cartoonish? What if it's funny? What if uh, the consequences of violence are shown? What if guns are involved or not? There are all these contextual questions you could ask. 
This is a study from 2008 that acknowledges that researchers have not yet answered a simple question. What kinds of violent video games are problematic for children? It's a little bit shocking that people that I think are mainstream researchers in this area would be asking a question like that, given the very strong statements that some of these researchers are making in other contexts, where they say, we know, and we have known for a very long time, that media violence causes aggression. Well, what about when we consider a variety of contextual factors? What happens then? If it turns out that games that are humorous are less of a problem, then California's statute is too broad. It's restricting speech that doesn't need to be restricted because maybe humor reduces aggression or maybe it increases it. It could go either way. But it's going to take an enormous number of studies to figure out which contextual variables matter and how they matter. And so any conclusions as to the effect of particular contextual variables is going to be much weaker than the broad conclusion that the researchers make. And I think the researchers would agree with that. So that's the second reason for uh, thinking the Supreme Court got it right. A third reason. The restriction on speech is supposed to serve a compelling state interest. It's supposed to help solve the problem. But surprisingly, we really don't have any evidence that restrictions on the point of sale by minors will actually reduce their exposure to violent media. We might have accumulated that evidence over the past decade as stores were becoming more aggressive about enforcing the ESRB ratings and restricting minors' ability to buy violent video games and target Toys R Us or Walmart. But so far as I know, nobody collected any evidence of that sort. So we really don't know that these statutes would accomplish anything. And absent that evidence, I think we have a problem. So those are three big reasons for thinking that the Supreme Court got it right. But since this is a Federal Society event, we need to have our moment of Reagan. And I'll offer one more reason. So Reagan uh, testified before the um, Senate uh, uh, Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, sometimes called the uh, Keith Offer Committee. And he argued that he was concerned about attempts to potentially regulate um, access to movies by minors. Um, he worried that it might have a negative effect on minors to teach them through laws such as these that people can restrict what they can read or hear. Now, he argues in the more extended version of the statement that parents do have a responsibility for uh, paying attention to what sorts of media items their kids are consuming, but he was worried about state, reg state regulation having a negative effect on people's perception of the extent to which government could restrict your access, your access to First Amendment protected material. Now, this is a causal claim that would be very hard to test. Is it true that if the state regulates minors' access to violent video games, that they grow up more receptive to government re regulation of speech? I'm not aware of any studies that address that question. It's a plausible hypothesis, though, in fairness to the media violence researchers, they're offering a plausible hypothesis also. But that's one more reason why you might at least have some worry about state regulation in this area. So one counter-argument from Justice Breyer's dissent, the counter-argument I think is, is one that most deserves a response. Um, Breyer says, look, we've got an enormous number of studies, and we're not really equipped as judges to understand, going back to my concerns that courts have a limited capacity to deal with scientific evidence, and that's the potential problem. He's saying, we don't have the capacity to judge all these studies. And he actually cites a large number of them in his dissent. So he says we should probably be deferring to the legislature's judgment in the face of evidence that's hard to weigh. You have these scientific researchers confidently making these claims. They do have a, a large number of studies that seem to back them up, although some of the weaknesses never get as explored as they should be in these cases. But they do have a large number of studies. Let's defer to them. So what's the response to Breyer's argument? Well, I, th I think. Uh, the response is this. If you actually went to the state legislatures, I don't think you'd find that very many of them actually sifted through these studies in the way that Breyer's suggesting they might have. Um, the states are often relying on a very limited number of studies. And I suspect that there are very few legislators who actually know much about what this research says. Senator Lee Lenny in California probably does. I'm not sure any others 
Um, if you, I actually listened to one of the uh, hearings that was held in uh, Utah. It was online. You could listen to it. The quality of the hearings was not particularly impressive. You could have significant worries after listening to this. The legislators have done a good job of really evaluating the scientific evidence. So if you're concerned that legislatures aren't going to be particularly adept at dealing with this evidence also, and that suggests there's a plausible role for the Supreme Court to be more careful in scrutinizing restrictions on free speech given the significant interests that are at stake. I said there was one wrinkle, one way that the Supreme Court's opinion suggests that there might still be room for some legis uh, legislation. Here it is, footnote three of the opinion. It suggests that the state might, might have the power to enforce parental prohibitions on minors' access to violent video games, suggesting that a state might be able to set up a sort of registry, sign up your kids for the registry, and then stores would be legally obligated to follow your wishes as expressed in the registry, where your kids wouldn't be able to play or to buy violent video games at the point of sale. So this footnote suggests that if state legislators wanted to pursue this further, there's at least an open question here. They're not saying you definitely can do this, but at least they leave the door open if um, legislators wanted to take this particular approach. All right, about 15 minutes left. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about uh, the obscenity, going back to the obscenity, yeah. the sexual obscenity. What's the justification for banning that? You know, you need a compelling amount. This is my first week of law school, so I don't really know. But um, what, uh, what's the justification for banning obscenity if you meet all these justifications for banning? Long tradition of worrying about children looking at sexually explicit material. And the Supreme Court says in the Brown decision that we don't have a similar tradition about violent material. And the state legislatures cannot expand that traditional worry about obscenity to violence. But on some level, it is kind of arbitrary for worrying about sex, but not about violence. Well, it's the flip side of what the worry is in Europe, for example. Um, and Breyer does score, I think, a debating point paints this picture of this awfully violent scene and says, well, the state can't restrict access to it until you know, some cleavage is, is shown. Um, now, I, I think the best response to that is in one of the amicus briefs that was filed. Um, Eugene Bullock was on that brief um, and some others. And their argument was that when we're talking about, it's already hard enough to regulate obscenity in a way that provides definitional clarity. Given the long history of not worrying about violence in the same way, it would be even more difficult to try to create a category of obscenity for violence. There'd be more ambiguity and uh, you know, problems with drawing lines, and so it's best not to go there. Yeah. I think another thing that Dr. Bullock said that, um, that another way that that fails strict scrutiny is the under-inclusiveness of it in terms of not being able to censor out all of the violence and sustain that uh, the individuals would come into and contact their media as a whole and that fails in that criteria. Yeah, and that's pointed out in a few decisions now. In the Kendrick decision, Judge Posner said, you know, the state might want to plausibly experiment in one area, and maybe they'd go after video games uh, uh, for that reason, rather than trying to go after a lot more. Um, but uh, you still have the other problems that I suggested, that these statutes don't really track what the research is after. So you might have doubts about the research, but even if you accept it, the statutes don't line up with it. It's focused on the graphic, explicit stuff, and the researchers keep telling us, no, Saturday morning cartoons are a problem also. And the statutes will reinforce a message that the researchers claim is a problem. So I'm actually surprised that they're somewhat sympathetic to these statutes. And I actually haven't read any kind of response from them about the mismatch between their research and the statute. So I don't know what their argument would be in response to uh, what I claim is a problem. I'd tell you what their argument was if I knew what it was, but I, I don't have to know. Does this not leave the door open for, and we talked about obscenity regulations, um, and those you know, are still meeting, meeting strict scrutiny as far as you know, restricting to selling to people who are 18 or over. And a lot of video games, I know when Grand Theft Auto San Andreas came out, the whole hot coffee mod that already blows up over, which showed consensual sex between two adults. 
but there are a lot of current video games which have sexually explicit material, whether it's GTA or God War or Dragon Age or whatever. Um, and the California regulation, which blocked the sale of any video games with sexual material in them to minors, would seem to overlap a lot of the violent games too. And is that still a question? There's still a possibility of trying to restrict access to sexually explicit material. Um, one important note about the hot coffee controversy, do people know about this? There was a modification to Grand Theft Auto San Andreas that you could use to unlock some material in the game. And uh, the material was sexually explicit, but it was described, I think, in fairly extreme terms. What rating, if you broadcast that footage, not broadcast, if you projected it onto a movie screen, what rating do you think it ends up with? R. R. <laughs> And it was an R-rated game. It was a mature-rated game. But the critics described it as if it was hardcore pornography, and it wasn't. It was shown in a movie theater with those crude graphics and given the lack of explicit detail. It would have been an R-rated clip at best. Uh, maybe with the crudeness of graphics, it might have been PG-13. But I'll, I'll give you the R. But critics described it as if they had snuck in the hardcore pornography. No, they actually snuck in R-rated content into an R-rated game. I remember during oral arguments there was a lot of talk about um, applying first time protection to video games specifically since they're not traditional media. Right. Do you think the court's decision that video games are protected speech will have impact on First Amendment jurisprudence towards newer forms of technology that might not have been thought of as traditional values of media? Uh, yes, it reinforces the notion that it's not restricted to um, books. I mean, we went through this with movies also. Uh, another implication, though, which is related to what you're asking, is that um, in the right publicity context, it arguably nudges video games out of the merchandise category and into the expressive category. And this is interesting because there's litigation going on involving the use of athletes in various college sports video games. After the Brown decision was handed down, the judge in one of the cases asked the litigants to respond to whether or not the Brown decision had any bearing on how to resolve the right of publicity dispute. Because Electronic Arts is saying, look, we have a First Amendment right to put people into a video game just to put them into a newspaper or book without a license. And the courts have resisted that in some cases because games generally tend to be slotted into this category of merchandise. And that's actually a category in some of the right of publicity statutes. For those who are out in their first week of law school, the right of publicity is the right you have to control the commercial uses of your identity. So somebody couldn't put you into an advertisement without your permission. And it's separate from the federal trademark laws or the Land Act, although they'll overlap in this area. Um, but you can't usually prohibit somebody from referring to you in a newspaper article. There's this intermediary category of merchandise, like a t-shirt or a coffee mug. The question is, where do the games go? Are they like coffee mugs? Or are they like newspapers, books, and films? You can see from some of the recent video games, they often look awfully movie-like. But the um, original trilogy of cases on games put them into the merchandise category, at least implicitly. The Brown decision arguably nudges games out of that category. Um, I'm not sure it will have any immediate impact. I think because of the way the California statute is written, the Brown decision probably won't have much of an impact there. But there's also litigation going on in New Jersey. Maybe that court will approach the issue. If I have the Citizens United, it can have a huge impact because this is part of a, a concurring opinion to that the citizens. That speech has to be relevant and effective in modern society in terms of that that's the electronic media that in that particular corporations or how you're able to effectively convey a message as opposed to trying to be one per, you know one small person going up and say NBC I and mean, you're somebody like George Soros and just simply buy a TV network then you have free speech as an individual but you have to be able to compete you know via associations via corporations and so forth be able to make a difference in things. Uh, yeah I really thought about it but maybe there's some implication there for political video games. Now the games that come out from Activision or Electronic Arts are usually not overtly political, at least in a partisan way. But you'll find um, less well-known games that attempt to be. So maybe there is some some payoff there. I haven't given it a lot of thought. They often teach history, for example, of the World War II games, 
see stuff, you know, dating back to ancient Rome, you know, 300, you know, things, things involving the Spartans or the Greeks and stuff like that. I completely agree. Um, and uh, I, I think, as a side note, that the original three cases that put games into this merchandise category, again, implicitly, they didn't phrase it this way, were wrongly decided for that reason. That, that, um, but they took a fairly narrow conception of games, and then that lingered for decades until an Eighth Circuit decision dealing with fantasy baseball. I'm hoping to finish up a draft of an article on that in about two weeks. And you like my little chart of board game publications and the historical impact. Uh, well, there are researchers who do resist the conclusions of, of um, like Craig Anderson. So there is debate that goes on among the researchers. Now, his response has been the researchers who disagree um, aren't doing original research. Uh, I think, I'm not sure that would apply to one of the uh, critics, but some of the people who he said disagree with his findings and the findings of others who decided that media violence does contribute to aggression. He says, well, they're not doing original research in this area. Now, I don't find that argument particularly compelling. Um, I think the question is, do those critics know what they're talking about? And whether or not they conducted a study on their own, I'm not sure it's decisive here. And I think it's also cause for concern when you define the relevant group with the expertise so narrowly that um, people with outside points of views are sort of pushed aside as well. You, your view doesn't count because you're not part of our little group. And even scientists can be subject to um, uh, you know, the sort of pressure of whatever the current scientific consensus is. So scientists um, are human too. And so outside scrutiny is a good thing. And so the extent Craig Anderson says, well, I discount what so-and-so says because it's not doing original research. I don't find that very compelling. But there are some people who do research that who criticize these conclusions. And I didn't mention one of the important questions in this research. So uh, a chunk of the research is tied to showing aggression measured indirectly through experiments in laboratories, and that's usually the best way to show a causal relationship. You randomly assign people to a treatment and control group and find out what happens when one group is exposed to media violence. And you have to find some way to measure aggression that is supposed to result from playing the violent media. And the way they measure that is, I think, questionable. And there's, there's still debate about whether or not that's a good measure that they're able to use. Because they're not, you're not going to put people into a room and one group plays Mortal Kombat and the other doesn't. And you know, guns are left lying around in both rooms, and the people playing Mortal Kombat start openly firing each other. That's not going to happen. Even if they did leave the guns in the room, it's unlikely that that would happen. The researchers don't claim that if you play Mortal Kombat, you'll suddenly become violent. Um, they're not making that kind of claim. And they're not making the claim that violent media is the sole cause of violence in society. They're making a, a lesser claim that it's one of the contributing factors, and, and that's where the debate needs to be. But the way they measure aggressive behavior, I think, is problematic. They use these noise blast techniques where they, uh, you think you're competing against a, another opponent in this competition, and then they measure how many decibel levels of punishment you inflict on the other player. And then if there are differences, they say, well, that's an indication of aggression because it correlates to aggression in the real world. We don't actually care if somebody turns up the decibel levels. And it's really actually has a footnote where he mocks one of these types of studies. It's not a noise blast study. It's a word completion study. Um, you know, he just kind of makes a jab at it. He could have said something more substantive, because there is a lot of debate about how good these measures are. That you can find even in fairly recent journal articles. Um, and incidentally, none of the courts really give a lot of attention to that. The one judge who I think did a really good job with the scientific evidence is the one who had a trial, who actually had Craig Anderson sitting in his courtroom and could ask him questions. Um, because he didn't have to go through the lawyer. He could ask clarification questions. What does this mean? And you heard my example of the lawyer not being able to answer questions like that. The lawyer's going to struggle with it. But that was uh, an opportunity to actually ask very basic questions. What does this mean? And he ultimately generated, I think, the best of the opinions, analyzing these issues. It's the Northern District of Illinois opinion. 
violence is just an extreme form of aggressive behavior. They're claiming that there'll be an increase in, in aggressive behavior in society. Some of that might be violent. Now, it's going to be, because violence is, is going to be rare, it's going to be very hard to show individual cases where you can say, of all the factors here, we can point to video games as one of them that caused a particular incidence of violence. Now, Anderson and others aren't, aren't ever going to claim it was the video game alone. They'll say there were lots of factors. The video games uh, were one of the factors. And, uh, uh, but even then, you're not going to be able to say, um, you know, we know that Columbine happened because the people who um, committed those crimes played violent video games. It's very hard to make that sort of claim. But they're saying, on the whole, uh, you'll have an increase in aggression, some of which will be violent as a result of violent media. Broadly defined, Saturday morning cartoons go at it. Um, it just seems so like, hard to pinpoint such a small, particular slice of the pie that would contribute to that type of behavior. It's like reports like some big, um, sweeping regulations on an industry. It seems like you're really trying to pin no. something down that's so elusive. Yeah, and uh, I mentioned uh, Professor Saunders, who argues for treating certain graphic violence as obscenity. He concedes that if you go the route of trying to rely on the scientific evidence, you'll, you may never get to the point where you can actually show with confidence exactly what the effect of the violent media is, given all the different contextual ways in which it can be presented. It can be graphic or non-graphic, funny or not funny. Um, it can show negative consequences of violence or not. When you read the violent video game literature, it's kind of mixed on the question of graphic violence. Because sometimes the researchers will say something like, if you show the consequences of violence, that should reduce aggression. Sometimes, though, they'll say the graphic violence is actually increasing aggression. But it's hard to draw firm conclusions from the mixed record on these very specific questions. And that's a problem for upholding these statutes. Because the statutes are sweeping broadly, not taking into account some of these contextual variables that the researchers say matter. They don't have enough um, studies to address how all the various contextual factors will affect players. Saunders says you, you may never get all those studies. We should go the route of treating this like obscenity. If it's extraordinarily violent, we can say it's obscene for minors. But the Supreme Court's now cut that out. Where do you think the failure is specifically? I don't know. It just seems like there's public opinion that there isn't, that parents don't know how violent these games that their kids are going to play. I think that the studies show that stores tend to enforce the video game ratings more aggressively than the other ratings. Um, I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it shows that the percentages are, are higher for enforcing those video game ratings as opposed to the movie ones. Um, so the video game industry would say we're actually doing a great job. Um, and stores have increased over time in terms of how aggressive they are enforcing the ratings. I mentioned earlier how we don't really have any evidence of whether that did anything. Kids can still borrow games from their friends, parents can buy them. Did any of this accomplish anything? Maybe not. Um, in which case that's a strike against these statutes because they're not actually serving any government interest. They make politicians feel good because we did something. Doing something is what we're here to do, whatever it is. Um, but maybe it didn't actually accomplish anything in the real world that's a value. Maybe it didn't uh, reduce anybody's exposure to the violent video games. And I don't know, maybe the opportunity to study that has been lost because uh, nobody bothered to collect that data as stores were becoming more aggressive. Anything else? Okay, well, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, it does argue the sort of opinion that I suggested um, in 
okay? Uh, but it's uh, an accessible book if you have further interest in the topic of what the research is. Feel free to grab any of the refreshments outside, anything out there is 